Today's guests are Nancy Simmons and Lauren Ingalls. Nancy Simmons is the CEO of Heartland Housing Foundation, which is a not-for-profit housing management body that provides affordable and near-market housing for over 800 residents of Strathcona County and Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. Heartland Housing Foundation currently operates 11 affordable and near-market housing sites, including four senior lodges and six seniors-only affordable apartment buildings. Lauren Ingalls is the CAO for Westwind Communities. Westwind Communities is a not-for-profit organization that provides quality housing and supportive services for seniors, as well as subsidized housing and services for individuals and families. It provides supportive living and public housing programs within the Foothills region of Alberta. The rent supplement program, though, extends outside the Foothills regions to include Bragg Creek, the counties of Vulcan, MD of Silver Willow, and the towns of Nancy and Claire's home. Ladies, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. So uh, I want to get the very first question off the bat here, and I want to know from you, and I, I know I just gave a brief description of your organizations, but... Can you, in your own words, describe what West Wind Communities and the Heartland Housing Foundation uh, does? So let's start with Nancy. Nancy, what does the Heartland Housing Foundation do? Sure. So as a housing management body, um, our, our purpose is to provide housing solutions for the municipalities that we serve. Uh, they've been established through a ministerial order with the province. Um, most organizations have been in place since the 60s. And fundamentally was created to create the supportive living lodge program within our province, which is very unique to our province. But it has expanded over the years and over the decades to really be the affordable housing provider for the municipalities. And specifically in smaller smaller regions, we serve uh, a greater population um, that require affordable housing solutions. So over time, we've expanded to not just be the provincially owned uh, assets within the province, but we've also expanded to meet greater demand um, and and meet um, housing needs for vulnerable populations. So in Fort Saskatchewan and Strathcona County, we we are diversifying the type of housing we provide so that we can provide a range within the housing spectrum uh, of that affordable housing, that 30% of income, as well as moving people slightly above that and, and moving into the near market rentals with the goal of eventually moving into affordable home ownership. Chris, we can't hear you now. That would help if I, did, I took off the mute when I, uh, after I ask a question. <laughs> so oh, we had Zoom again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Only three years. Um, I, I do apologize if I pronounced your name incorrectly, Loran. Um, can you explain what West Wind Communities does in your words? Well, I think Nancy's really summarized it really well. We're both housing management bodies. Um, originally, we were created uh, specifically to provide housing, seniors lodge accommodation uh, within specific municipal areas. And since the 1960s, we've expanded uh, not only the type of housing, but the diversity of housing uh, that we're providing in our local communities. And that we're working really hard to continue to provide uh, not only affordable housing within our communities, but to provide interim steps from social housing uh, to near market housing uh, in order to uh, allow people to uh, provide provide and seek um, affordable housing options in our community. Um, probably the, the key part of um, the services that we provide are our supportive living lodges, our retirement living lodges. Um, they are our, our fundamental program that we provide, and that's housing seniors who generally have lived in the region or have ties to the region um, and allow them to remain in their local community. Um, I think we've found since the 1980s with the advent of more social housing programs that we've expanded uh, to include not only seniors in senior self-contained or independent living, but also to provide family housing, housing, specialized housing, housing for individuals, and more recently, uh, a rental assistance benefit program, uh, which also allows um, any low income population to seek uh, market rental accommodation. So it's really providing choices and options uh, while remaining in our local communities. Yeah. So I, oh, I just want to throw in one last question before I throw it to Ian here, because 
I want to know in the last few, I would say even the last two years, housing has been a big story on the municipal level, provincial level, and federal level. Organizations like Westwind Communities and the Heartland Housing Foundation, are you seeing a higher than average application uh, inquiry rate over the last few years? Or is it the same as it was pre-COVID-19 uh, back in early 2010s? Are you seeing a higher than average uh uh, application rate for your organizations. Whoever wants to take that question first, I can, I don't mind going first. Uh, it's interesting when we look at the communities in the geographical area we serve. Um, we've actually seen only modest growth in those communities, right around two to four percent. Um, two of the municipalities in the region we serve are actually cities, so Okotoks and High River. Uh, but they're they're still framed under the premise of town. Um, and so those have been really, really quite stable. I, I think a couple of things have, have transpired. Um, the Provincial Rental Assistance Benefit Program was actually suspended in late 2019. So we saw that program uh, for Westwinds went from serving 170 households uh, down to about 117 households by the time it was reinstated mid 2021, we lost 30% of our clients. And so that pushes your demand for your other programs uh, really up. Uh, just in the last year, um, just looking at current stats, our demand for social housing has grown 93% over the last year. Uh, we see in our communities that there's very little available in the rental market actually for the last 18 months. Um, so there's zero inventory. Uh, forget about a, affordable inventory. There's just none. Uh, similarly, in our family housing, the wait list has grown 90%. Um, so our seniors, the wait list has grown 93. Our family housing has grown 90%. And our rental assistance benefit program, we actually have funding available, but there's no inventory stock um, for low-income household earners to be able to rent stock. So it's like a, a perfect storm of sorts. Um, our support of living, and I think it'll be very different for Nancy, our support of living has been, remained really constant, even through COVID. Uh, we maintain a small waiting list and it's been very stable. Nancy, what about yourself? Yeah, so interestingly enough, Strathcona County is Alberta's most populous specialized municipality. And so if we were to be considered a city, we'd be the fifth largest within Alberta. And that's ahead of St. Albert and Medicine Hat and Grand Prairie. But the the growth, the growth in our community has has been um, incredible, I would say, over the last 20 years. Uh, and with that, We've, we've had to be able to introduce affordable housing options to be able to incentivize employment opportunities to the labor force. So what we're seeing is people may work here in our communities, but they're not part of the community. They're probably living in Edmonton and using public transit to come and work because they just can't afford within our community. And similarly in Fort Saskatchewan, with the amount of growth we're going to be seeing over the next five to 10 years with um, large scale industrial projects, the demand is going to continue growing. And what we've seen specifically since COVID is COVID actually stabilized housing precarity. People had um, benefits from the federal level to kind of stabilize their housing. And as those benefits have ended, we've seen the struggles and we've seen the increase of housing need and people are really struggling as we exit this pandemic and start to create the new norm again. So we are just in the process of introducing the rental subsidy uh, for our specific um, area, our region. Um, normally it's managed through Edmonton, but we're going to be starting the administration and we'll be able to allocate specific dollars to our community rather than being part of a larger bucket that's administered within Edmonton. So that in time will, will um, help us identify the need and how it's growing over the next couple of years. The both of you represent uh, or operate in regions that are, as Lorraine mentioned, a couple of cities, some towns, some rural areas as well. Nancy, same with you, essentially a couple of cities, some towns and villages and rural areas too. Do you see well, a couple of questions? First of all, do you see people moving from the rural areas into the urban? Because 
as we work with local governments, we're seeing some of that happen for, around, for housing reasons. And the second is, do you see different type of need in, in terms of the housing that you provide in the smaller centers than you do in the larger centers as well, in terms of either the continuum of housing or the amount uh, amount of housing that's required for people who are looking for it. Uh, maybe Nancy, I'll go to you with that first. Sure, I, I would say just being fairly close to in proximity to Edmonton, we're probably seeing an influx of population into our communities because it's more um, livable communities. And so people are probably more attracted to moving out into our areas. But being a county, there's lots of smaller areas and people are probably moving closer into where the amenities are and wanting to be closer to their support systems. Um, the second part of your question. Um, oh, I lost it. That's OK. So the two parts were really are uh, are you see is there a difference between rural need and urban need or suburban need? And then the movement of the population that you've kind of addressed. So it'd be what's going on in Josephburg versus what's happening in Fort Saskatchewan. Yeah. And so what we're seeing is um, the influx of population into the larger centers and just ensuring that we're creating those housing stocks that are near and closer to um, amenities so that transportation is easier for the lower income population. Thanks. Lauren, what about for you down in High River? So High River and the Diamond Valley community just over the last 20 years, their population growth has been very modest. Um, they haven't grown quite very substantially in comparison to the town of Okotoks, um, which, you know, has grown just tremendously in the last 25 years. And you really see some challenges associated with that affordable housing or the lack of compared to the other two communities is, is one of the challenges. So we actually see a lot of people who would choose to live in Okotoks are living in the surrounding communities of High River and Black Diamond due to not only affordability, um, but lack of affordable housing stock that's available in the town of Okotoks on it. Um, we also see uh, you know, a, a big challenge and a big barrier, just as Nancy Mann indicated, is transportation um, between those communities and even into Calgary. Um, Okotoks has a considerable commuter population, High River, definitely to a lesser degree, and same with Black Diamond, but there still are a, a lot of commuters. And the affordability of housing plays into that in terms of people's choices. Um, mm -hmm. The Diamond Valley marketplace uh, and High River are substantially uh, more affordable for, for households. And so they're choosing those communities when there is a preference to remain in Okotoks. So we kind of have a, a skewed perspective of, of demand uh, just based on the lack of inventory that's really available. Um, but we know this because people apply and their first choice is Okotoks. But when we tell them that you know the housing is available in these other communities, then they choose them as well. Uh, in terms of growth, um, we're seeing, continue to see growth in those communities. Um, I think that they're probably more in sync. Um, but the other piece that, that factors into um, each of those communities is the availability of a social support network um, in, in order to support their housing choices and allow them to remain in the community. And, and some of our municipalities are much more advanced than others um, in terms of the social supports that they're able to provide um, people who are needing affordable housing. Thanks. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in again and ask ask another question too because a lot of the people who watch this podcast are local government folk, and when we work with local governments, including places like Diamond Valley and Okotoks, we have found that they are almost always feeling a need to address the topic of housing, even though housing per se isn't something that falls within the local order of government. How are you seeing the uh, the effect of the requirement for housing? whether it's market or non-market and, and the stock that you provide, having a, the relationship between housing and the local governments and with, and with, uh, with which you operate. Is it growing? Is it staying about the same? Or are you a somewhat arm's length, of course? So how is that having an impact on what you provide and what is expected by people who support their, their various local governments? Lauren, maybe start with you. I think within our local communities, uh, 
Okotoks, Diamond Valley, and High River housing is really at the forefront, uh, particularly in, in Diamond Valley and in Okotoks, it's increasing in High River. Um, so much so we've seen each of those communities uh, complete an affordable housing needs assessment um, to the communities actively partnered uh, with us to get those needs assessments done. Um, housing in Okotoks right now is absolutely critical. I think it's uh, probably either number one or number two in terms of issues. And you see the municipalities really stepping forward and making affordable housing a real priority in the community, um, not, not just from doing a needs assessment, but from land donations, awareness, advocacy, being an active partner, coming up with creative programs to increase the supply of affordable housing. And of course, um, for us as housing management bodies, there's that underlying uh, contribution that they provide every year through requisition funding uh, right. for our supportive living program. And so I find within our communities, they're a very much an active player. They have representation on our board um, and they don't look at us as just the primary solution whether it's market or non-market, um, that they're very conscientious of needing to uh, meet the demands for their growing communities and on a creative basis as well. Thanks. Nancy, what are you seeing with the, with the local governments you operate with? Yeah, so I, I would say that, I think, Chris, you're right, that housing is a topic of conversation across this country. And the reality for smaller municipalities like Loren and I is that it does become a municipal problem, even though they want to be careful that they don't they don't go into the world of affordable housing because there is a, a level of responsibility from the province and the federal government to help establish the need within our community. But the reality is, is we still want our communities to thrive and that does become the responsibility of the municipality. So we're very fortunate in being a key partner in the discussions of affordable housing within our communities. And so like Loren, We've, we've worked with our local municipalities to find ways that are less cost prohibitive for the municipality to contribute to housing and the affordability of it. So looking at ways that they can contribute land either through a, a direct transfer of land or long-term lease agreements that will help us establish the, the developments or looking at ways to be creative in property tax exemptions, whether if it's through a grant, um, if they want to protect the property tax itself, uh, and also relaxation of development fees. So where where are the red tape costs that could help us as developers reduce our overall cost? And we want our aim and our goal is to create the lowest affordable housing developments in order to reduce the amount of rents we charge back to, to our population that we serve. Thanks. And I might just add to that that um, Alberta municipalities some years ago produced a, an excellent document on um, options that municipalities could could explore to incentivize affordable housing development. Um, you know, from secondary suites to um, providing small grant incentives uh, to fast tracking affordable housing development in addition to the waivers. Not all of those options have to cause money, cost money. Um, that uh, those pieces, um, I think there was probably 13 to 15 options that were available have really proven successful in other jurisdictions within Canada really to incentivize housing. And I think any municipality that's genuinely interested in uh, furthering affordable housing development in their community um, would, as part of their affordable housing strategy, really look at those options and see see what priorities um, and success stories they can have in their own community. Thanks. You, uh, Westwind Communities and the Heartland Housing Foundation are both Alberta nonprofit organizations. Now, I'm not sure if you're speaking to organizations that are similar to yours in British Columbia or Saskatchewan or across this great uh, country of ours, but what are the issues that are facing nonprofit organizations like yours when it comes to housing in Alberta? And if you've spoken to people outside of Alberta, are they the same in Saskatchewan, British Columbia, or even Ontario? So, so I'll start. I would say what we're feeling the biggest pressure 
is that near market housing, which is our our newest form of development, how we create affordable housing, um, and it's a percentage below market, is that it's still not meeting the demand of the population we serve. So near market will be 15 to 20 percent below what the rental market is, what demand is saying. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily equate to an individual or a household's income, which is the 30% we'd like to see of housing costs. So we're still seeing people having to pay anywhere from 30 to 50% of their income on housing. So the, the crisis for us, and I think we see it quite often with our partners in BC Housing, that it's just not meeting the, the demand. We're still having people spend exponentially on on housing and that just takes away from the other areas that help them thrive. I don't know if Loren sees differently. Well, I might just add to the conversation more on a national basis that uh, Alberta really lags behind in affordable housing uh, compared to other provinces. That I think as, as housing operators, we're just striving to be average. We just wanna hit that average um, housing stock available in Alberta that's um, well-maintained and allowing allowing households to pay a reasonable amount of rent. And unfortunately, we've gotten behind in our affordable housing development. We haven't been consistently um, over the last 25 years. More recently, um, there's been a, a surge in development, uh, but for many years, there was no housing stock. Uh, developed on a continuous basis. And so now we're behind and we're seeing that in, in the growth of our wait lists. And I think the priority right now in Alberta is to play a little bit of catch up, but uh, even if we got to average on a national basis, that would, that would you know, fundamentally make um, material improvements in the quality of life of many Albertans. So I just want to pick up on something that Loren just said there. You said the wait list. And I want to know, how long is the average wait list right now for your organization? If I go apply for your organization today and I say, my grandmother or a senior that I know needs a housing in your area, what's the average wait time? And has that only been increasing because of that supply is not being met with affordable housing, with senior complexes, with senior housing, with low in low affordable housing? What is the wait time like? So I would say in our program, in our support of living or seniors retirement residents, um, the waiting time is relatively short. It would be under three months. Oh. Um, so it just allows people to plan and transition. Uh, but if you're looking at social housing, which is 30% of income, whether it's seniors independent or family housing, you're waiting 18 months. Um, if you're, because of course we're waiting for turnover to occur. Um, and that's, that's for somebody who, Chris, I'm going to assume that you're in high need, that you've got low income, you've got many dependents, and, um, you know, the housing that you're currently in isn't safe, isn't secure, perhaps it's not accessible. If you're our high demand client, you're waiting approximately 18 months uh, to get in. Nancy? So um, I would say similar to the seniors program, we're like Loren, it's usually three months, like we we can, there's enough turnover that individuals who are waiting for the program can get in. When it comes to, if we think of all age housing and what the demand is here in our community, it's a little bit harder for us to understand what the need is because we don't have the same programs that Loren has down in High River or what's happening in Edmonton. There's no community housing uh, or rent geared to income for individuals who have families. Uh, once we get our rent subsidy program in place, we'll have a better understanding of what the need is. So when people are looking for housing with families and they come to us, if we don't have a unit readily available, they're likely not going to want to sit on our wait list. They're going to go and find housing elsewhere because they need housing today. So we don't have a good mechanism right now to be able to track that until we have better programs that offer a variety of solutions for the people we serve. Nancy, a few months ago, you mentioned to me uh, how the, the, the turnover that's that's happening with the people who move in and then potentially move out or uh, free up space. Are you seeing people staying with uh, Heartland Housing longer or shorter over time? And is there a reason for that? So our, our near market housing that serves both 
um, families and senior populations, it's a very stable housing support. Usually once they come into our program, um, it could take them several years to move on uh, and become more stable into that next level of housing. In seniors supportive living, uh, with the with the onset of COVID, what we have seen is individuals may be coming in and staying a shorter amount of time. So that might have a higher turnover. Uh, but our, our normal independent living housing is is fairly stable for our community. You see the same thing? Very similar to Nancy in the supportive living um, that we do experience in regular turnover. And, and we have found post-COVID that the turnover has increased. Um, in independent living for seniors, we found that um, the turnover is relatively stable, um, that uh, our seniors are staying with us for an extended period of time. In our family housing, that's where we've seen, so our social housing for families, uh, we've seen the turnover stop, mm -hmm. that um, many families are choosing to stay with us or, um, They've graduated to the rent supplement program where they can afford something that's a, um, a reduced subsidy and uh, they've, they've stayed with us. Um, so we found that program to be relatively static um, all through COVID and, it, and it's still continuing just due to the lack of uh, affordable rental rates in our community. Even with the rent supplement program, it's still not, not affordable. Households can't afford to pay $1,900 market rent, um, even if a subsidy is available of six or $700 for them on it. So we've seen it become really static. And our near market housing, which is 20% uh, uh, below market, we've also seen that it's static. People aren't moving. There's no turnover. The, the, so the last question for me would be around terminology. Uh, you've made reference to affordable housing. Housing, Nancy, I think you had referenced that that's 30% of income given. Are you finding in communities like Okotoks or like uh, Sherwood Park, for example, where there are relatively high average incomes, that even affordable housing isn't attainable just because of numbers? Lauren, do you see that? We, we do. Um, Okotoks, for example, has a, um, a really vibrant uh, service sector, lots of retail development. And um, the availability of that population to be able to afford to live in Okotoks really isn't sustainable. It, it's improved in Diamond Valley and High River for sure, but we don't see it in Okotoks um, that there aren't attainable housing options uh, for a lot of our population, even with rent supplement, um, unless they're a two income household population. Um, if they're single, um, parent population with a dependent, it's really, really quite precarious. They often need social housing, that deep subsidy, uh, paying rent at 30% of income. And we see there that there's considerable gap. And that's where we've seen one of the biggest increases in our wait list. Is it the same with you, Nancy? Yeah, so what we see in specifically in Strathcona County that rents could be anywhere from 15 to 20% higher than what you would see in Edmonton. So it's a higher market for people to be able to live. Uh, and we normally see an outflow of population. So people leave when they finish university and they move into Edmonton and they may not move back to their home community where their supports are until later, whether that's 35 or 40 when their families are well established that that's when they would move back into Sherwood Park. So there's this out, outflow of population and in order to stabilize that and create the community that, that Sherwood Park really wants, we need to create affordable housing that can maintain single individuals and, and one bedroom units at affordable rental rates, I would say is one of our key areas of focus. Thanks. I want to ask the final question here before we do our wrap up and it's a overarching one and it's kind of a, I didn't send it to you guys prior to the interview. So this is a unique entity here, but what does success look like to your organization? At the end of the day, what do how do you measure success in the nonprofit housing market? So let's start with Nancy on that one. So I don't think there's a way for us to ever feel like we're done. I think the job is always going to be there. What we talk about in our communities is how do we create localized solutions that help our community members stabilize housing within their community and to really help where they work, live, and play. 
And something we talk about quite often is how can we ensure that we as a community are not putting our, our burden, the housing burden on Edmonton, who then has to take care of a greater surrounding area. We want to ensure that we can continue allowing our communities to thrive. And in doing that, we stabilize housing. So we, we work at localized solutions and we work in great partnership, not just with our municipalities, but with our community partners, all of our social support groups who can help give wraparound support services over and above housing. And I would say that's one of our biggest successes, who we partner with and how well we partner with them to create localized solutions. Lauren, how about yourself? Well, I'm going to drill down a little bit more. I'm going to say, you know, satisfy tenants and residents, um, because those are social indicators and determinants of, of health, and not only of those individuals, but of a community too. And, um, you know, making sure that people can live in an environment where they have dignity and respect, um, I think, bides well for the overall arching community. Um, I'd say a broader range of housing and supports in our local communities, because housing isn't enough. Um, as we're finding uh, globally and particularly nationally, um, how important mental wellness is, not just physical wellness, but mental wellness. And so, you know, housing, of course, is a, a big indicator of stability, uh, but we also need those supports in our local community in, in order to have um, all segments of the population thrive. Uh, Well-maintained housing stock that's market relevant. Um, both Nancy and I uh, talked about the fact that uh, our organizations are over 60 years old. And uh, in our case, we have housing stock that's at the end of its life cycle. Uh, it's it's well-maintained, but it might not be relevant to today's population. Even things like plugins, having insufficient number of plugins and in housing stock that's 35 years you know, of age and you've got nowhere to plug in all your electronics um, can really be problematic on it. And ensuring that that housing stock is safe and secure and well maintained is a challenge that I think Nancy and I face pretty routinely in trying to balance our budgets. Um, of course, timely admissions to our programs and services. You know, ideally, we talked about uh, in our supportive living program um, that there's uh, enough turnover and there's enough product that we see that we're able to house people in under three months, waiting years for housing um, when you have limited resources. Um, you know, that's heartbreaking. And I think Nancy and I encounter that all the time. Um, people are urgently seeking housing. So uh, success to me looks like being able to house people on a timely basis, that they're, uh, that we have some housing options and solutions for them. And of course, we wanna make sure at, for all levels of government, uh, particularly the province and our municipalities and from our own selves, from a governance perspective, that our operations are sustainable. And uh, that becomes really important because that allows us to uh, then be able to grow our organization and provide more housing supports and services in the future. Now, I did say that was my last question, but of course, I always come up with the very last, last question before I actually end the, the segment. At the end of 2023, how do you hope to grow your organizations? What, what's on the future? What's on the horizon for West Wind communities uh, tomorrow or this year? Lauren, do you want to take that one first? Because then I'm going to ask the same question for Heartland Housing Foundation next. I, I feel like the COVID fog is lifted for West Winds communities. Um, we started in January a tenant support coordinator program that I'm very, very excited about. And so this helps our existing clients maintain their housing um, to avoid unnecessary evictions, um, increase their life skills, and be able to access um, local, provincial, and federal supports that they may need. And it's bringing the service to them because uh, often a barrier, uh, particularly for our seniors population, is being able to physically access those services on it. So we're really excited about that program because we're we're hoping that it helps people um, maintain their housing and also to successfully transition um, when they're ready and if um, if they're meeting their goals and their potential to other housing streams. 
on it. Uh, we have uh, two projects, one in the planning stage and one currently under development in Okotoks. So uh, we have 10 units of affordable and near market housing. Uh, so a spectrum of rental rates, um, small steps in terms of alleviating some of the housing uh, rental demand in Okotoks. But uh, um, the other project we have in the planning stages is in the Darcy um, Quadrant of Okotoks, it's an additional 10 units and we're applying for federal uh, subsidy and if successful, construction will start before the end of the year. Um, we've also been fortunate uh, as a long-term operator of the Rental Assistance Benefit Program, uh, we've seen a 20% increase in funding. And so we know that there's some market rental stock that's coming online in each of our communities. Uh, we hope that some of the local incentives increase that stock and that we'll be able to have uh, allow households to be able to access that stock and further reduce our wait list for our programs. So um, all of it is small steps, but collectively we hope um, that each of those steps are, are really helping our local communities and our community partners being our, our municipalities and various not-for-profits and really attaining um, some measurable increase in cutting down on those wait lists. Nancy, what about yourself and Heartland Housing Foundation? What, what's in store for 2023 for you guys? Uh, so similar to Loren, I don't know that I recognize that we've lifted from the COVID fog, but I think that's what was exciting is we were working at such a fast pace that when we came out, we started up talking about what more could we do from a um, goals perspective. And we've done a lot of work internally of reducing barriers for the people we serve. We've looked at our application process. We've looked at the way people come into our housing and eliminated things that we wouldn't necessarily put on ourselves. We wouldn't put barriers on ourselves to get housing. And so we want to ensure that that doesn't get pushed down onto the people we serve. So that's one area operationally. Uh, we are currently developing a project in Fort Saskatchewan. It's the first near market or affordable housing for all ages in Fort Saskatchewan. And it's going to be an 83 unit net zero development. Uh, really exciting for us to open that opportunity up to Fort Saskatchewan and start serving a population that's never had the opportunity to be served uh, in that community. So that will be opening in the next couple of months. We're just in the final construction phase. And then we're also starting a planning project in Sherwood Park for a replacement of an old lodge uh, that will become um, uh, affordable or near market housing for all ages within the community. So that's our next phase and our next planning um, that we'll be partnering with various community partners to develop and meet the needs of their population that they serve as well. Lorraine and Nancy, I want to extend a personal thank you from both myself and Ian for sitting down and talking about how housing and organizations like Westwind Communities and Heartland Housing Foundation play a role in helping people. For more information about Westwind Communities and the Heartland Housing Foundation, please visit the, lo the links in the show notes.